They're found anywhere in the world these days, the 20th century adventurers, people of the BBC who are based in Bristol. BBC Bristol. We call it BH, Broadcasting House. It's really a block of buildings, the Bristol base for the Network Production Centre, regional television and local radio, and all the 500 or so people who work here. Strangers and stars pass through the front door from early morning to late at night. Morning. Morning. For me? Yes, sir. Good. The veterans like Jeremy Carrad and the recent newcomers with Radio Bristol. You're listening to BBC Radio Bristol and Morning West. And a very good morning from myself, John Wormsley, here in the chair right through until 9 o'clock. And I've got a very nice record request in front of me. It comes from a lady who wishes to remain anonymous, and it goes to all the women's institutes in Somerset. And she says, thank you very much indeed to all the ladies out there for helping her in the past few years. And she says, thank you very much, and she'd like to pass on a dedication of a record. Well, that's what we're here for. Music, news, information and entertainment from the boisterous baby of White Ladies Road. There's always something happening here, always someone looking into their studios. Mrs. Trent is waiting outside. Can she come in now? Yes, of course. Okay. Morning, Mrs. Trent. You have to be a bit quick, because it's only about two and a half minutes long, this record. Mrs. Treasure really is her name. Even the squad of early morning cleaners find that time is against them in this world of broadcasting. There's no time to do any knitting, certainly not for the charming girls on our main telephone switchboard. BBC. Uh, good morning. John King. Uh, just a moment, please. I think John King's in the cutting room. I'll check for you. The film cutting rooms. Temporary wartime buildings. Yet the biggest BBC filmmaking centre outside London. Uh, if you just go back a few frames, please. Now, can, if we can get a cutaway in where Arthur crosses over here, you see. Well, get one there. All right. Yeah. Something like five million feet of film pass through the 13 cutting rooms here every year, nearly a thousand miles of it. Film that comes back to base by the canful from cameramen working all over the world to be edited and snipped and looked at and timed and stuck together until it's shaped into programmes. Oh, that's that one. Eight minutes, sir. About, roughly. Do you want any more from this? No, no, take it back to the top. Take it back to the top. Right, right, stop. Stop, let's have a look at it from there. John King and film editor Charles Aldridge working on another edition of Collector's World. Hello, and uh, welcome to Collector's World from Paris. Arthur and I are in the heart of the French capital. The Arc de Triomphe behind us, we're going down the Champs Elysees towards the Place de la Concorde. This is the heart of tourist Paris. It's the area of the city that certainly every visitor knows well. But it's not the Paris we've come to see. Three miles away from here, to the north, and we're now on our way to it, is a market. Of its kind, the finest in the world. It's the Portobello Road and Petticoat Lane and Bermondsey Market, all rolled into one. It's called the Marché aux Pousses, the flea market. And as soon as the cameras stop rolling, the film is rushed back to Bristol. Making sure cameramen and crews are in the right place at the right time is rather like a military operation for the film unit manager. Through more then. Yes, yes. He's never really surprised where he'll have to send his men next. It could be almost anywhere in the world. Two weeks. For two weeks or to go in two weeks? Yes. Um, for ten days. Yes, we'll be right, put Collector's World in up there. Yes, it'll be Morris Fisher, Peter Rees, Dickie Bird. How do you want them to go? By car or sort of are they going to fly? To go to Cologne by road. Um, okay, fine. We'll get all the other details a little bit later. Right, so I've got a problem. Can you deal with it now, do you think? Yes. Come on, let's see. And here's another Bristol man with a problem, Mick Rhodes, head of the Natural History Unit. 
it's about these blokes that we send off all around the world. It's about the gear they take. At the moment, they're working on Bolexes and there's a lot of mute footage and you yes. don't quite know what people are saying and things like that. And yes. we're going to move towards more sync sound. We're bound to. Mm -hmm. Now, what sort of gear would you send a bloke off with if he were going for, say, three or four months, he's living in a tent, he's nowhere near anybody who can service his cameras, but he's got to walk with it up hills and up mountains and so forth and so on. A very real problem for people like cameraman Doug Fisher, who can't afford to have faulty equipment working miles from civilization with Geoffrey Boswell. They're in Patagonia, and for them, a wildlife safari is just that. And there's no point in asking a penguin to do that scene again because the camera's broken down. Other natural history programs, though, pose other problems because some animals have disappeared from the this face is of the, the earth. the largest land animal that's ever existed, John. It's a diplodocus, it's a giant reptile. And we're doing this program about the problems of being big, but the problem is really how to make Tony in the right size in relation to the size of the animal. Yes, we've either got to make him appear big in the studio or um, make him smaller in relation to um, the model. Uh, on a landscaped background, a prehistoric landscape. Yeah. How, how do you feel about being the... contracted? Yeah, I don't know, I'm all for it, but the difference in size is enormous. I mean, in real life, this thing was very much bigger than me, wasn't it? Oh, it is indeed. Well, I, I suppose, you know, Tony's about six foot, aren't you? About yeah. that. And I suppose you appear about that size, really, uh, about yes. uh, the size of one of its front legs. Well, short of drinking so from the a problem? bottle that says, drink me, how do you do it? In a case like this, it's back to the drawing board in the design department, making a model of the creature John Sparks and Tony Sopo want to use in their program, Animal Design. Yep. Quarter fly. In here, they can knock up almost anything. And again, it all has to be planned and sorted out long before the program goes on the air whether it's a prehistoric animal for the natural history unit or a desk layout for Points West. Well, we've got an item. Um, I'd like you to leave with the gas and follow on with the bridge. Have you got the Fairfield um, lady comment stuff? No, I've got it, but it's in Pat's tray. I'm going to dig it out. Television for Points West with a program five nights a week is urgent television. It deals with news, and news, like a penguin in Patagonia, waits for no man. It happens, and someone has to be on the spot as soon as possible after it's happened, if not sooner. Yeah, well. At the morning meeting of the Points West team, they look, as they say, at prospects. In fact, the devices story, which um, we really needed tonight, has fallen down completely, so that's gone. And what we've got instead is um, a gas thing. And Bill Morris is on his way back from the line. Yeah. Cameraman Bill Morris is indeed on his way back with film for tonight's programme. And like many other motorists, he relies on his car radio to help him while away the miles. We got there at about half past three in the afternoon, just as it was beginning to drizzle. We parked the car... He's tuned into a man whose jaunts on television and radio have taken him to many foreign parts. It's a vine fest. A wine festival. Yes, a vine fest. A rather vet vine fest, but well attended. For the powers of the grape are truly wondrous. Ah, well. Might as well go quietly. Well, I don't really like doing this sort of thing, you know. <laughs> Thank you. These vine fests are held in lots of little towns along this part of the Rhine. And when they have a vine fest, they have a vine fest. Now, the grape must be treated with great care. The treading, the handling, the bottling, and the drinking. So, mind how you go, for this is not the way to drink wine. It is prudent to take wine with meals, for wine without meals makes fools of us all. It encourages the reckless, depresses the melancholic, excites the hysterical, buckles the weak need, and initiates you into a blood brotherhood that can only lead to a heady disaster. And this seems to be quite a problem that gets around all these different islands. Yes, well, I've done a chart actually which shows that uh, the point on the mainland to which we have to go back in each case. Yeah. So, for instance, um, we, we go to Majorca and we can go from Majorca to Marseille. And it's over another glass of wine, Chateau Bristol, that Johnny Morris and producer Brian Patton carefully consider where to jaunt off to next. A holiday in the Mediterranean to make you think it's possible, is there? That's true. You know, Look, uh, Brian, do you mind if we talk about it as we go back? Because I 
Doug Thomas will be screaming for me now, I'm imagining. We're on the floor at two. Right, yeah, or we can walk around together. A decision has been made. It looks like the Mediterranean this year. But there's another programme waiting for Johnny, Animal Magic. Have we got enough camera cable on there so that you can clear that? It doesn't look as though we have. We got some more... What's that over. up there, Stan? Is that a leaf from the top? That's it. Is that a leaf from the top of that lamp? Well, well I'll see you after um, Animal Magic. Yeah? Can I have my spy? Fine. Lovely. Bye-bye. Dave, he's just on his way. It won't be a moment. We'll be ready to run in about a minute from now. Studio A, where the cameraman and lighting engineers are lining everything up for this evening's live transmission of Animal Magic. Lighting has to be just right, so do the models that make up the studio set. It looks absolute chaos at this stage during rehearsals, and even the experts are often baffled by it all. It won't be on there. So I'm but it will appear to be on there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look across there, you'll see it on that monitor. That's it. So you'll know where it is. I don't understand how it works. No, it's marvellous. <laughs> <laughs> and when you look at something, it isn't there. Animate. Here they go, waiting for the cue from the director and the floor manager to run through the first sequence. Hello. That's um, Happy Holiday Snap. It is Happy Holiday Snap. Mm, nice to have Happy Holiday Snaps, isn't it? Well, you know, when the weather turns nasty and uh, winter really begins to bite a bit, it's nice to just slip through your... Happy to three. While Johnny talks, the production team have the stopwatches on him. Even words have to be tailored to fit the arch enemy time. ...when it's nice and warm, and there aren't very many people about, Anne and I go for a bit of a walk. Studio A gets many strange animal visitors, from Dotty the ring-tailed lemur, or mice that come in small cages. It might even be an elephant, but for today's animal magic, it's one of the beautifully turned out police horses from the Bristol Constabulary, which has led towards the hustle and bustle and glare of very strange surroundings. Now let's trundle over to J2 positions. This is what a television yes. studio looks like to the people who work in it. Lights with thousands of candle power, microphone booms, cables everywhere, Cameras working like dodgem cars, and the courteous concern of the makeup girl. Is it really showing, Liz? Just My a great moustache. Really? Yes, you need almost no makeup. Okay, Johnny. Thanks, Liz. Nothing needed. Coming out of the film, two shots, five. Six. When you get One. yourself a pony. Shot eight on three, four next. Exact and precise directions from the control gallery to the four cameramen who provide the pictures that in here are mixed into a continuous program. Right, hold it there. Rehearsals are nearly over. Time again catches up. With a program being broadcast live, everyone must know exactly where he or she should be at any given time. That goes for the horse too, or at least its rider. You can afford to come forward about the yard. Last minute directions from the floor manager, last second calculations by the production Stand secretary. By, it all adds up. It's ready to go. This is the point of no return. Ten seconds, run telecine. Nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. On transmission. Can we have the animation closed up tight, please? 15 seconds. It's a quick standby for you, Telecine, at the end of this one. 10 seconds. Coming to one. Five. Cut to one. Cue Johnny. Animate. They're away. Another program is on the air. Before a film, as opposed to live television, can go on the air, there's much complicated work to be done. The film has to be edited to the right length, but in most cases, sound effects have to be added and music. The commentator has to add his words, and it's all done on this multi-track machine in the dubbing theatre. One spool may have music, another the speech, another the effects. They all have to be mixed together onto one track. I think we just want some neutral exterior atmosphere on this, Peter. Right. A few cries. Here. Normally, 
working people. It's in here that the finishing touches are put to the many films for Animal Magic, The World About Us, and for regional television programmes like Brown's Towns. Finding new jobs for Bath ratepayers is today as much the duty of the city council as caring for the royal present. For the men who created Georgian Bath, life was a lot simpler. That's how we see the film. They could ignore the pressure for this is how you see it. beginning to transform other towns and concentrate their energies on building a town dedicated not to work but to play. No portrait survives of the two architects, John Wood and his son, who did most to build it. But what they were obsessed with creating does. Classical proportions, modified by an Italian palladio, and applied Just one of the weekly programmes broadcast by regional television from Bristol. But the staff are always conscious of the nightly programme. OK, cut it there. That's fine, Derek. That's what I want there. Well, a bad shot there. Good. Now, I want to go up to the downs here and do some more shots there. OK, so I think I finished all I want to do yes. here. Just before we do that, I'd better check with Points West to see if I'm wanted. OK, you do that. I'll do it on the radio ready. phone yep. now. OK, and I'll get my car. Silver Charlie 5 to help Bristol. Any messages for me, please? Over. Silver Charlie 5, help Bristol. A message for you from Points West. Uh, we'll go to the gas explosion in the Union Street area. Over. Roger to this, Bristol. Um, we'll come immediately. Out. Silver Charlie 5, this is out. Sorry, Dennis, I've got a rush. Points West seem to have an urgent news story a gas explosion. All right? Points West cameramen are in constant radio contact with base so that they may be sent to an urgent story. The sort of story that produces the same urgency in the newsroom of Radio Bristol. Yes, okay. Yes, we will. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Right. Mitchell, I think you better take the radio car down to this explosion. Get down there as soon as you can. Ring in when you're down there. We're listening out and talk back. Probably like a couple of inserts before lunchtime. I'll leave it entirely to you. But get down there as soon as you can in the radio car. Okay? While radio reporters and film cameramen rush to cover a gas explosion, in the Natural History Unit, they're looking at a sequence of one of their films, The Insect hey, Man. Parisi. Hey, come, monsieur. I will show you something more wonderful than the view from the top of Mont Ventoux. I think this is uh, going to be quite a wait, George. Et voilà. Bring your camera here. We are indeed fortunate. That is Sphex. Albisectus. She has already been digging for some time. When the cell is ready, she will bring a locust paralyzed by her terrible sting and lay her egg upon it and seal them off together until the baby, the larva, has eaten the locust and is fully grown and ready to emerge. Just watch her. Such industry. Now oh, she's filling it in now. I didn't see any locusts. No, no, not yet. It's only a temporary cover. To prevent unwelcome guests from entering while she's finding her prey. And how long do you think she'll take finding it? I cannot tell. Half an hour, an hour, three hours. <laughs> you must be patient. Why, once, uh, not far from here, I was watching Sphix in the early morning. And three women passed me on their way to pick the vines. In the evening, uh, coming home, they passed me again. I was in the same position, sitting by the bank, watching. Mon Dieu, they said, what manner of a creature can this be? <laughs> they made the sign of the cross. We must be patient. And infinite patience is needed to film the life cycle of a hunting wasp. Specialist filmmakers concentrate solely on this type of work. Even so, Christopher Parsons needs other material. Can we talk about Favre a minute? Sure. Gerald Thompson's got all the hunting wasp material I need, but I'm desperate for some pine processionary moth uh, mm -hmm. film. I seem to remember the French did something on this some time ago. Uh, yes, there's a, a French scientific documentary. I think Science and Features used it a mm -hmm. couple of years ago. Um, there'll be some colour master in London. Oh, good. 
Have but we, we have to get clearance through the French Embassy. Mm. Mike Kendall in the Natural History Library. If any special wildlife film exists anywhere in the world, he'll know about it, often from memory. The Natural History Unit is not only international in its work, it has international contacts and the traffic is very much two-way. Indeed, the producers and cameramen of the unit are part of the international set, jetting to faraway places, some of them barren and bleak, others warm and welcoming. Ned Kelly films on Ascension Island, a far cry from his previous trip, that was on Mount Everest. Besides the pictures on film, the sounds are important too. The babble of the wide awake turns will be an important adjunct to the final film, but these sounds too will be preserved, brought back to Bristol to add to the comprehensive wildlife sound library. But meanwhile, thousands of miles away, back at base, the convoy of heavy vehicles needed for television outside broadcasts takes to the road. They may have to operate where there's no electrical supply, so they take their own generators. They have a mobile television mast to transmit their pictures back into the network. Putting a show like this on the road needs careful planning beforehand and working closely with colleagues in London and other production centres throughout the country. Outside broadcast units, OB units we call them, may be needed for match of the day or a state occasion. Gina, what's the OB unit doing on the 31st? 31st? in Hampshire with John Dobson. The main vehicle of the OB unit is really a television control gallery on wheels. Right, Alan, I'd like to record six sequence 15 straight away, if I may. Yes, I can. Camera's that shot, 57, sequence 15. OK, Tony? Yes, John. Right, stand by VT. Come to three first. Run VT. Everything in the BBC seems to have initials. BH for Broadcasting House, VT for Videotape Recording. Stand by David Vine and kill him. In this new series, we're going to do exactly what the title suggests, play tennis. Programs like this and others are discussed at the weekly management meeting of the Wise Owls of White Ladies Road, presided over by Stuart Whiten. What about the concert from the Colson Hall on Friday night? Did um, anyone hear that? Yes, I heard it. I thought it went well. I think it's rather a pity that um, there's these long breaks where they have to reorganise the whole platform. The same thing happened to you. Stuart Whiten is the man ultimately responsible for all the programmes produced for the networks from Bristol. Well, poor old Brian Gear having to reel through page after page of his background material, which I thought he did very well. But it seems an awful pity from the listener's point of view that there is mm. this sort of background noise of furniture removal. What about the music, though? Um, there was a specially composed work by Daniel Jones, um, who conducted it. Um, what did you think of that? Well, I think I only heard part of it, because we were having our evening meal at the time, and the rest of the family decided it was rather modern for them, so I think we, we took a short break of our own at that time. <laughs> <laughs> Managers are entitled to time off as well. They're talking about a concert by the BBC Training Orchestra. 35 young musicians based in Bristol who give somewhere around 60 public or broadcast concerts a year. Players who graduate to fill vacant chairs in the country's leading orchestras. On his way to another meeting is John Craven, a meeting that's also concerned with young people in the programme Search. I think it would be very helpful to everybody watching at home is that when you first speak, if you could explain easily before each programme, the youngsters taking part get to know the compere, the producer, and the others involved over a cuppa in the canteen. Well, it, it is a bit, but I mean, if you're talking specifically about Liverpool, I mean, it's, uh, and you don't come from Liverpool, it's worthwhile knowing that you don't. The main thing is that you've all come from all over the country today to be on the programme, so for goodness sake, say something, because if you don't say anything and you go back on the train this evening, you're going to feel pretty fed up, aren't you? I've got, I've, got a well, I've got a problem as director. I don't always just want to take shots of the people who are actually speaking. And some of you just now, I was trying to take a shot of you looking interested and you're looking up at the lights, looking at the monitor, 
chewing your fingernails or whatever, can you try and actually turn your head and look at who's speaking and actually listen to what they're saying? Because you may be able to come in with something really good, you know, and it looks very odd if you're looking incredibly good. This is one of the locations for the film made by the joint winner in our drama section, Michael Chappell, who is 12 and who comes from nearby Wolverton. Michael has called his film Hit and Run. Would it be all right to talk to him now? I think so. But just before the Search I... Film Competition each year attracts some remarkable films. There are always about 200 entries, and the winner gets a chance to direct a film using a professional right. BBC crew. Can you remember anything about what happened? And how did you feel when suddenly everybody arrived, uh, all for you? Well, first of all, very nervous, but later on it got all right. Were you in control, did you say? Mm. Yes, I think so. How's that? Yes. All right? right. No dialogue on this, is there, Mike? No. He just has his realisation that he's yeah. in the hospital. Check the focus, then. Oh, yeah. Not on this shot, though. No, not on this shot. This is just a pullback from his face. Yeah. With the utter realization. A young film director's dream come true in search. And now we come to an interesting sequence. Some very distinguished people coming into the picture. On safari in wildest Somerset, the Living World team on a Radio Nature Trail. Ivy, I think we could do quite a good yeah, piece on this. Yeah, we'll do that bit, can't we? Yeah, it'll suit you us think? nicely, yeah, I think. Yes. Talk yeah. about the ivy climbing up the birch tree. Incidentally, if we could mention the old controversy, which is still raging at the moment, about uh, whether, whether it does any damage. Yeah. All right, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, there was a letter in the paper today about that. Was there? <laughs> yeah. Topical. There are always Topical. letters in the paper. <laughs> right. Uh, well, folks, some, some steps at the start. Who's going to be steps this time? Shuffle the leaves, David. You always do. With Dillis Breeze and myself, David Streeter and Boots. All the sounds in our Radio Nature Trails are the actual sounds we hear and record out in the countryside. But in studio productions, for radio plays, for instance, things aren't always what they seem. Producer Brian Miller lets another cat out of the broadcasting bag. And, uh, it's uh, a scene where you are painting, you see. You're painting the wall throughout yeah. the scene. It's a bit of distemper. Now, it'll sound really good. We play this brush with the center and do little brushing motions like yeah, that while you, while you speak. OK. okay. okay. Yeah. Now, for you, um, I want you to uh, be, as if we're doing something else, yeah. So I want you to wander about a bit, you see, I and kind of, as it were, fiddle about over yeah. here and pretend okay. to. But you stay on mic throughout, brushing on this business. Yeah. And at the end, on speech, uh, what it is, uh, four, um, five, three. four, five, three, four, five, two, uh, or four, five, one, that's the one, Barnes. I want you to say, right, if you'll hang on a minute, I'll come with you. Put your script down, do your bit with our hands. Okay? Right. Right. I suppose you think I'm not in earnest about all this. Is that it? That I'm just playing about? If you say so, mate, that's good enough for me. I tell you, I'm going to find that girl. And I mean to marry her. Oh, yeah? What's so funny about getting married? Well, it can be funny, all right, getting married to a tart, believe me. I don't know for certain that she is... that she is taken to that sort of life anyway. Uh, that's what I mean to find out. Oh, good for you, mate. When I first told you, you seemed to think it was a good idea. You seemed pleased. Oh, well, yeah, I was pleased, all right. Pleased as punch to have stuck up to a nice mannered lunatic who give me five quid a week. But I don't suppose you give it to me for the privilege of my sound advice, did you? I certainly did not. No. Well, I thought as much. Which is his own personal reactions to work. Many radio programmes these days are recorded on magnetic tape, like Roy Hayward's series on photography. Give enormous satisfaction. That's good. Right. You come out with the word satisfaction. That's good. And we'll come in again just a little bit later on. When does the Fedagallic series start, Roy? December. If we go through December into January, with a repeat, we hope, in the summer, in about June. Six programmes. 20 minutes each. Well, this chap's awfully good, isn't he? 
Lewinsky. I think he's one of the best um, lecturers in photography, certainly. Yeah. He certainly gets his point across. Well, From that point of view, I think he ought Good. That's to start be great. to think Transport. not... Another program ready to go on the air, the deadline met. Meanwhile, over in Television Studio B, another deadline for Points West is approaching fast. And now pumpkins. Well, they may not feature much on your menu, but on the continent, they certainly enjoy them. In America, they scoop them out and put candles in them for Halloween. I can't say it now, pumpkins. Sounds rude. I think I should say that. And now, how about pumpkins? That doesn't sound much better. Anyway, in the small village of Alderton, I know you're trying to time it, in the village uh, of Alderton near Chippenham, they're going to hold, of all things, a pumpkin fair. As the excitement hots up, one of the organisers, Mrs. Alison Midwood, has come along to the studio with some of her pumpkin entries. You know, she hasn't arrived yet. The weather forecast, though, has arrived, and the graphics man makes up a board that will show the latest predictions of the Met Office. And in one of the film cutting rooms, there's still last-minute editing going on for one of the stories in tonight's programme. Liz, how's that gas explosion thing getting on? I just got finished this piece first for John Norman, Michael. What, what about ten um, minutes? Oh, about, oh, about five, I should think. No more than five. I've just got a little muddle here to sort out first, and I'll do your piece. I'll get done in time, don't worry. In the studio, though, Jeremy Carrad is worried. We need a Mrs Midwood. Don, Don is Mrs. Midwood. Right. Have you brought in your pumpkins? Not Mrs. at the Midwood. moment, Jeremy. No, they're coming in later. Are they? You look very nice, Mrs. Midwood, actually. Mm. Um, where are they going to be, these pumpkins? On the table. All around here. All around there, yeah. And we'll probably put a, a rostrum at the end. Are they very large? Mm. Still no pumpkins, but Points West men and women are prepared for such emergencies. If the lady and her pumpkins don't appear in time, they can't exactly wave a magic wand, but they can use a standby story kept in the rack for just such occasions. What do you mean, just there? Yes. If you bear in mind that at that point, we're going to close up the small pumpkins. It should be about there yes. somewhere. Mm. It wants to be at least um, five or six seconds before you lead on to the other pumpkins, which will come up at just about that point. What do you think I can say about a small pumpkin for five seconds? Whatever you do, don't tell him. Now, as the seconds tick away towards six o'clock, the gas explosion story that has kept many people busy all day is just about ready. Two minutes to oxide. Thank you very much. It was a near thing. Yes, stand by. Ruth. Yes, Jeremy. Uh, I've worked up four seconds with the small pumpkin. And you're coming to which one after yes, that? Hang on a moment. We're going back to the very large one behind you at that point. The one up on the block in the background. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah, I think I've got that. And then idea. move got... very quickly on from there down to the pumpkin jam on the table. Ah, oh, well, it looks like being pretty good weather for the pumpkins, if nothing else. Anything more for Telecine? The machines, Telecine machines, loaded with the film stories for tonight's programme. Stand by TK2. Right, stand by. Run TK2, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, on film. Jeremy. Good evening from Points West. First of all, the Avonmouth Bridge, the M5 link by, across the river, and as we all know, over the past year there's been a success. And so the news goes on the air to television viewers and to listeners sitting at home, tuned to the BBC transmitters in the West. This latest explosion happened when a man lit a cigarette and threw the match down a drain. Gas board engineers and police have been on the scene and the road's still closed. Continuing coverage of news in the West. You're listening to Home Run, coming to you from your local radio station, BBC Radio Bristol, the voice of the West. My name is Colin Mason, and we play music. This little number is called Si, Senor. Music for the motorist to mark the end of the working day, at least for some. Out on location, there's still light in parts of the world, light enough to get some final shots of the wide-awake turns before they settle down on their rocky roosts. Okay. 
And that crew we saw earlier on location in Israel is also thinking of packing up for the night. Back at base, though, there are still staff on duty through the evening hours. Through this room, the switching centre at Broadcasting House Bristol okay. are sent the signals from London and elsewhere to the transmitters in the West and Wales. One vital link in the chain of radio and television that covers the country. And covering the country from Bristol is very much part and parcel of the weekly radio programme, Any Questions? Montgomery, Alamein, School, Winchester. Yeah, yeah, this is a transmission at 2030. Yeah. The engineers on site are already linked up to Sir. London via post office lines, as the production team consider the questions for the programme submitted by the audience in the hall. How can any trade unionist have the nerve to ask for £9 a week more in his already bulging wage packet when old age pensioners are expected to live on just... Over half Okay, here's a spot of tone for you. Yeah, I'll cut it. There we are. And can I have uh, Radio 4 continuity now? Radio 4. The time is 8.30. Time for any questions. Reaching homes with cosy firesides of a Friday evening. But more practical questions concern Geoffrey Boswell and Doug Fisher in Tierra del Fuego and other crews like them elsewhere in the world working for sound radio or television. Will their clothes be dry enough to wear come the morning? Not for them, the home comforts, not at least until they finish their work thousands of miles away. We may envy them their travel and the scenery and their sense of adventure, but come the end of the day, this is the picture that's always with them. BBC, Bristol, BSA. News for the South and West, read by Douglas Ward. Positive or to one. This is your presenter, Brian Hawkes. Looks to me like a jolly good Bowfront show. This is BBC West. You've been watching another film made in Bristol.